1 Samuel chapter number 1, and we're going to start with verse number 9. I'll give you a little forewarning here before we get the text. I'm not going to ask you to stand, but we're going to jump around a little bit because uh, I didn't want to keep you here for 30 minutes just reading text because this is a quite, kind of a long story, if you will, and the way it unfolds. And normally I don't do this, but we're going to jump around through the text so that we can bring out of the text the most valuable verses so that you understand the direction God's taken me in. But I'd like to for you to realize that the message that God laid on my heart is for so many people, especially, um, is, is there anyone here today, you don't have to raise your hand, but is there anyone here today, you've had some prayers that you've prayed, maybe you've prayed for a while, and they just seem like maybe they were unanswered. You, you ever prayed anything and you felt like God isn't answered yet? Uh, it could go on months, weeks, years. You know, I've been praying about this one thing. There's some family here you've been praying for loved ones to get saved, and it seems like it's just been years and years, and still yet they haven't given their life to God. Uh, I believe this message is for you and for other people, people that are going through personal grief, pain in their life, and uh, you took it to God, and you asked God to to fix it, um, but for some reason nothing's changed. Have you ever given something to God? And you just felt like, I mean, nothing's changed. And I believe this message is for you. And I also believe there's people that have a desperate desire for God to work something out, something that's beyond your control. I don't know. I can't speak for everybody, but I'm a, I'm a fix-it man. I'm the kind of guy that if something's broke, I want to fix it. I can't hardly, if I walk past something hanging off the side of my car, I'm going to want to fix it. I like to fix things. But sometimes God lets you go through things that no matter how much of a fix-it man, you've got to take it to the real fix-it man because you can't fix it. There's a reason why God allows things like that. But I believe this message is going to be for you. If you have it, say amen. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. Again, we're going to skip around a little bit, so bear with me as we do that. 1 Samuel 1 and 9 reads this way. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh. And after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she, talking about Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. What was she meaning? I'm going to give this child to the Lord, and he'll be a Nazarite. Now let's skip down to verse number 19, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah and Elkanah or Elkanah, however you want to pronounce it, knew Hannah, his wife. In other words, they were intimate. And the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son, called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Now we're going to skip a little further 
toward the tail end of the context of this story. 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Give you a minute to get there. We're going to jump to verse 19 and verse 20. This will help sum up or summarize what God's put in my heart to preach to you. 1 Samuel 3 and verse 19, if you have it, say amen. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet unto or of the Lord. This is what I'd like to preach for a while this morning on when a prayer becomes a prophet. Will you stretch your hand to the Lord? Let's pray. Lord God, this morning we're thankful for your word. For the next few moments, God, I'm asking you to smile upon the words that I speak. Anoint them in such a way that will penetrate through all confusion that there may be clarity and understanding, and, Lord, that there will be conviction in this atmosphere. Challenge us. Encourage us. Help us to see our need to pray. Turn our troubles over to the one that's able to deal and fix these things, and we will praise you for all that you do in this service. Save souls, sanctify believers, and baptize in the Holy Ghost, and we'll give you praise, and everyone can say amen. Some of you may or may not be familiar with this story that we have just read through some of the text throughout this particular story. But the story of Hannah and her inability to have a child, and then she earnestly begins to pray before God and ask God to give her a child. In my opinion, it's probably one of the most heartwarming stories that you will read in the Bible. Now, some of you ladies might get a kick out of this, but when I read this, I thought this would, have been, this would have made a good theme for a Hallmark movie. Some of you ladies that like the Hallmark movies, this story would have been a real good one for that, a good plot, if you will. But it's a heartwarming story because it's about a woman who's not able to conceive a child. And it's hard for me to read what Hannah went through, and it's hard for me to read the way that she... Uh, or at least the way the Bible explains her emotions and the way she reacted in her grief. And it's hard for me to see all of that without seeing her sincerity in prayer. I mean, think about it for a moment. We'll get more into it, but I mean, think about it for just a moment. She is praying so sincerely. You know, sometimes we think when you're praying sincerely, you got to be praying like some preacher that is on fire and you're, you're lifting the roof off, you know, and you're just going at it, you're sweating bullets and you know what I mean. But there are times that, and, and I don't know how to explain this other than to say I've been in some agonizing places of my life that when I prayed, I wasn't hardly making much noise. I was praying but I wasn't praying very loud. I was just kind of going at it because of the way that I felt on the inside. You ever felt like your inside was just ripped out of you? You ever felt that way before? And that's kind of the way I feel like that she may have felt whenever you read the way that Hannah responded to her grief and her dismay about being a, a barren woman. And Hannah's a, a barren wife. She's not just a barren woman, but she's a barren wife. That means I'm married to this man, but I'm unable to give this man a child. He loves me dearly, but I cannot give him what he expects of me to have a child. See, in our culture today, that might not mean a whole lot. But if you were to understand the culture of the Bible, many of the the women in their day who could not, or the womb is closed up and they couldn't have a child, they would consider that like a curse to them. Many of them thought that that was a, a curse. And matter of fact, the Bible even said in verse number 5 of chapter 1 that it was the Lord who had shut up her womb. Now, that was the way the Bible explained it, that the Lord had shut up her womb. And I, I couldn't help but wonder to myself if God, foreseeing that there would come a time 
that she would be moved because her womb is shut up and cause her to pray. And that made me think about the places of our life that we go through things that God already knew that the only way he could get us to really pray through is to allow us to go through something. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, because there's, if, if life is always easy and there's no problems, there's always lots of money in the bank and you can just do and go as you please and you're always happy about everything, everybody around you is always happy, there's never any drama in life, then there's a lot of people that would never really find the need or the necessity to pray. But I want you to understand the same way that it is in a relationship between a husband and wife. Husbands will understand what I'm saying. In the generation that we are in, we have come up to a complex problem. What is that? We have seen so many years that women are trying so hard to prove that they can do everything that a man can do that we've got to a place in this generation that it's almost as if the man is unnecessary in the relationship anymore. I believe it like this. I believe that two people ought to be co-equal partners in a relationship. But if I have nothing to offer the relationship, there's problems in that relationship. And I can tell you, ladies, from a man's perspective, that if I feel like my wife does not need me, I feel unnecessary in the relationship. So there are things that make me feel satisfied. If she cannot fix the car and put a starter on it, Brother David, and and I'm able to do that, it makes me feel valuable. It makes me feel needed. It makes me feel like if I'm the only one in the house, Brother Jesse, that can kill the spider. It makes me feel needed in the relationship that I can do something that you need me for. And do you understand that when we look at the relationship between his people and God, that God wants us to have a need for him? How many of you know how it feels? Any parents in the house? You know how it feels when your child comes to you and they need something and you're able to explain to them or teach them. It makes you feel like you have value in that child's eyes. It makes you feel important and it makes you feel like you, your self-esteem is not suffering, if you will. And I believe this morning that in the same way that God wants you and he wants me to have need for the presence of God, to have need for the answers of God. And whether that be the case with Hannah, I don't know 100%, but I feel like that's the right direction. But you see that God has already shut up her womb according to the text. And now we are coming to a place that if it's not bad enough that her womb is closed up by God in In a relationship, in a marriage, the Bible shows us that her adversary provoked her sore year by year. Now, some would say that it was the uh, 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 the other wife, if you will, but in this case, I believe that the Bible would have clearly said that that's who it was. How many of you know that who our adversary is? We have an adversary. That that's the devil, right? And I believe that the adversary that was coming against Tana, outside of the people that are on the outside, the the other people that may uh, make fun or may say things about her, believe the real adversary is the enemy. Now, you know that the enemy, like I said Thursday night, he's not coming with a red face and horns and a pitchfork and a spiked tail. He's not coming like that. As a matter of fact, there's ways that the devil comes to you. Do you know the way the devil comes to you? He don't, uh, I know that they may show that in movies and stuff, but their cabinet doors are not opening by themselves and beds are not hopping up and down and furniture sliding across the floor. I mean, that would be a little weird and spooky now, wouldn't it? But when the devil comes to you, do you know the way the devil comes to you? Right here in your mind. The devil likes to talk to you. The devil likes to talk you out of things. He showed us that with Adam and Eve. He showed us that whenever I preached about that the other night about how that he came to Jesus on the pinnacle trying to talk him out of his deity and the Godhead. And so the enemy likes to war, but where does he war? He wore somebody say in our mind tonight or this morning. So she is tormented, the Bible shows us, and I believe she's being tormented in her mind about her barrenness, about how she's not good enough, about how she cannot perform her her wife duties, or maybe she's cursed, and the people in town, they know that she's barren. They see her without a child. She she sees all of that. And so annually, they have a, a trip that everybody takes annually, 
and they go to the temple, and they, at the temple they worship there, and in the temple they would sacrifice during this particular time. And they began to praise God during this period of time, if you will. And so these were the times of the year, like when you read about Job who would make sacrifice for his children in case they had sinned. This annual going to the temple is a lot like you and I getting down and confessing or praying and repenting over our sins because what they would do is they would bring animal sacrifices to the temple and they would worship God there. They would bring their sins before the Lord. And so this is an annual time every single year when this barren woman goes to the temple. She knows that she's going to be before God. She knows that she will be in the presence of God. And when she goes there, she begins to weep and she begins to cry and she begins to mourn and lament her barrenness. She is so perplexed and plagued by the fact that she is a barren woman. And so the Bible shows us that what she would do is she would stop eating and she would start crying. Every year, whenever it rolled around, she would start crying and she would stop eating. I, I, I just can't imagine someone understand this woman is going through a terrible amount of grief in her life about, uh, about her uh, barrenness, if you will. And finally, the Bible shows us that they arrive at the temple. In verse number 10 in chapter 1, it says, she was in bitterness of soul and she, she prayed and wept sore. I want you to see Hannah this morning as she is down praying to the God of all of creation, the God who, who loves us, the one that could easily just speak Speak a word and just like that, she'd be pregnant. You understand? We serve a mighty God. If you agree with that, say amen this morning. And so Elkanah or Elkanah, her husband, he doesn't understand why she's upset. Now, I never realized this when I read the text before. I don't know why that I didn't pick up on this. But when I read that, it really stood out like a neon sign this morning when I read over it again. And why is that? Because here's a man that lives with, this is his wife. This is a woman that he is married to, his wife, and yet his wife does not, he doesn't know that the reason that every year that she's crying and, and she's, she's not eating and he doesn't know why. He does not know why. Why is that relevant, Pastor Myers? What hit me like a ton of bricks? Because she did like a lot of people do. She does not want to burden somebody else by her pain and her grief. And so she concealed that pain and that grief and bore it on herself. Have you ever done that before? You didn't want to burden your husband or your wife because you already knew they were worried about how you were going to pay the rent. So you didn't want them to tell them that the car payment was going to be due here, here pretty soon. Or you, you were so burdened with so many other things in the family. And so you just bore that on yourself. And you knew that your wife would worry if you told her you were having chest pains because and you didn't want to bother her. So you bore all of that on yourself. And I want you to understand that when you do that, it's a very heavy burden to carry. And when you're married, it's even heavier because the reality of marriage is, is that you're supposed to be able to bear burdens together. But when, you, when you're married and you're perplexed by something that you're carrying all by yourself, do you know it seems heavier than if you were a single man or a single woman because you look at it and you think, I've got people I could share, but I can't share. Do you understand what I'm saying? I've got people that I'd love to tell them. I'm hurting. I'm feeling depressed or I'm discouraged, but I don't want them to worry about what's going on. And so this woman has borne this burden about her barrenness, all her, her embarrassment, her humiliation. She's borne that all on herself. Anybody feel Hannah's pain? And so the Bible says she wept and prayed to God. And the Bible says in verse number 11 of chapter 1, and she vowed a vow. Now she's praying, she's weeping. I want you to hear what she said. She vowed a vow and said, oh Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, it tells me this morning, Sister Rachel, that this is not any common, ordinary kind of pain. She refers to the way she feels like affliction, like somebody has afflicted her and her body. Her mind is afflicted. Her emotions are 
afflicted. And she says to God, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, remember me and not forget thine handmaid. It's not enough to just say, God, remember me. But she says, remember me and please don't forget me. Why? Because God, I know that the universe is vast. I know there's lots of folks out there, but here I am in Bassfield Park in this little old trailer here. I'm nobody important. That's the way the enemy wants you to feel. And so here she is and she says, God, I just want to make sure that you don't forget I need you to move. I need you to turn some leaves over. I need you to move in my situation. Has anyone else ever felt like, God, I've got something I need the hands of God to move some things? And she said, remember me, forget not thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child. All I want, God, if you just remember me and give me a baby, that's what I'm looking for. She said, God, I will give unto the him unto the Lord all the days of his life. There shall no razor come upon his head. And I want you to see this morning, it is a prayer of God. If you will do this, I will do that. Now, some folks may fall out with that, but there are times of your life, it's not like you're trying to make a deal necessarily with God, but you're letting God know uh, if you're that faithful God up in heaven, if you can answer this prayer, you deserve my allegiance and my faithfulness, and in return for everything you do for me, I will be faithful back to you. If you'll give me that job back, if you'll give me that child, if you'll put my marriage back together, if you'll let my ministry succeed. God, if you'll do this, I will be faithful. I will serve you. You know what blows my mind and breaks my heart is when people make promises like that to God and they don't follow through. I've seen God spare people's life on a hospital bed or surgery room and they promise God if you'll just do this and I come out alive, I'll serve you. I'll start praising you. I'll preach. Lord, if if you'll just bring me through this trial. I'll obey the call on my life. I'll be in church every time the doors open up. And I want you to understand, sometimes you do that with good intention. But Hannah is a woman that's going to do more than just intend. She's going to do what she says she's going to do. Somebody say praise the Lord. I want you to see that her whispers of prayer were marked with so much grief that even the priest thought that she was drunk of which she replied now think about this Amen. her prayer, her prayers are so mumbled jumbled she's whispering to God crying through tears can you imagine praying like that with so much grief that your pastor said you're drunk girl get up out of the altar what are you doing down there you've been drinking too many paps blue ribbon honey what's wrong you had a few too many Jack Daniels this morning on the way to church Amen. this woman is so grieved so afflicted that she prays and the man of God thinks she's drunk but the Bible says I I am a woman of sorrowful spirit I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink but she says I have poured out my soul before the Lord do you feel that I poured my soul out to God do you know there are times of your life that the reason that you're not seeing a breakthrough is because you pray these little mamsy pamsy prayers God bless this little hamburger amen and you take a bite and you're not really genuinely pouring out your heart before God is there anybody besides me you still believe that if we're going to get an answer that if we're going to get a breakthrough we've got to get back to pouring out our heart before God amen honey it's a difference of you getting down in a place of prayer and you burning before God and and nobody's there. Nobody's listening. You got nobody to impress. Listen, I know folks do that in church. But honey, when you're desperate, you don't care who hears you. You don't care anymore. I prayed before and it may sound gross. But I prayed in such desperate seasons of my walk with God that I'd have a string of snot from the floor all the way to my nose. I sat up and thought, oh, that's gross. But when you're desperate, you don't care. When you pour out your heart, you don't care. Say amen. Lift your hand and give God praise. 
If you've never prayed like she prayed, if you've never prayed that kind of prayer, it may be difficult to imagine the intensity of a woman's prayer such as that. But you see, this morning, I, want, I, I can want something so badly. And I know God has the power to speak the word, and it's done. But it ain't happened. It ain't happening. I know God has the power. Do you know that the enemy will use that against you? Oh, yeah, he will. Am I preaching somebody? I hear you call yourself a Christian. Here you are suffering. You can't even pay your bills. What's wrong with you? When you got the enemy afflicted and pressing on your mind as to why, why would you love a God who, who must not love you because otherwise he would answer you? Have you ever had the devil jump up on your shoulder when nobody's around and do you like that? My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, here's a woman. I want you to see her. These are the kind of things she's got to process while she's down in prayer. Here's a woman that's barren all while seeing babies born on the left and on the right in that house and that house through adulterous relationships through prostitution and careless mothers who had babies that never even wanted them and how can you pray when you see all of that going on having children and yet here you are here's little old you You nobody from nowhere that's the way the enemy wants you to feel somebody say she was afflicted in her mind She was afflicted in her mind, yet through tears and anguish, she prayed anyway. You ever had times where you didn't understand? You really didn't. You really didn't. You loved God, but you didn't understand. And you prayed anyway. You ever prayed prayers and you didn't know for sure whether they'd be answered, but you prayed anyway? You ever prayed prayers and you know how it's going to work out, but you prayed anyway? While you're praying in the back of your mind, you could almost see it might not work out. You might have to figure out how to go get a loan. You may have to go get an attorney. This might not work out. I've been there. But you prayed. Somebody say she prayed anyway. Through tears, through anguish, she prayed for a child. God, if you'll just give me a man child, I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. I'm convinced in my heart, especially after the many years of preaching and pastoring, that it's prayers like the one that Hannah prayed. It's prayers of desperation that move God like nothing else will. It's those kind of prayers that get the attention of God. How many of you have ever prayed before and you're willing to admit that it was a pretty haphazard prayer? It was pretty empty. You ever prayed an empty prayer? Come on now, you might as well be honest because even your pastors prayed before and it was about it was full of fluff and no stuff. Come on now and say amen. But it leaves me wondering, is it possible that the reason that some prayers go unanswered is because of our lack of sincerity in prayer? We don't pour out ourselves before God. We're not intense about the need. It's just like, well, God, I'd like to have this. Come on now, when somebody really wants something, you ever heard the term a squeaky wheel gets her grease? Come on now, some of you, you need to pray without ceasing. The squeaky wheel will get the grease. Do you know if you're child ask you 14 dozen times after a while you'll get the idea they must really want it but if they just ask one haphazard time you might not really get the point but I believe we should pray without cease and believe with with faith say amen somebody amen I find that I want you to hear this because the spirit of God reminded me of something that I've seen myself but I believe this morning that Motivation is a catalyst to sincerity. Sincerity moves God in a way like nothing else does. But how do you get to the point of sincerity? What is the catalyst to sincerity? What comes before sincerity? Whatever it is, 
that motivates you to pray will will determine the sincerity or the level of sincerity by which you pray. Let me give you an example of what I mean. You get a sick child and a caring mama. You'll pray. Huh? You get a dying spouse. You're going to pray different. You get a desperate, I got to have an answer right now kind of need. You're going to pray different. Let me, let me give you even more understanding. You're flipped upside down. I want you to see this in your mind, okay? You're traveling down the interstate. You get in a car wreck. Your car is flipped upside down on the interstate. Wheels are spinning. Smoke's going up in the air. And inside of that car is your wife or your son or your daughter. And they're pinned and trapped in their car is on fire. Would you pray desperate? Versus riding down the road and somebody texts you on the phone. Hey, man, don't forget to pray I get that job tomorrow. Okay. God help me get that job. That's a lot of preaching right there. And we want to know why our prayers a lot of time, they hit the ceiling and never go no further. At least that's the way it feels now, don't it? Because when it gets bad enough, you'll pray like it's bad. You pray different when it's desperate. You pray different when it's a real need. Huh? You know the rent's due in two months, so you start praying about it now. Oh, by the way, God, please help us to make sure in two months we can pay that rent. About three more weeks go by, and you're like, oh, God, please make sure you get that rent. Please help us make sure we can pay that rent. But I'm going to tell you something. When you get down to a few hours right before the, you're going to be past due, huh? God, please, now, I'm going to be praying about this two months now. Huh? Please, I need a checkup. I need an update. What's going on up there in heaven is the check been mailed out yet, God? Because I'm in bad shape. Huh? When you start getting desperate, you're going to start praying different. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. And there are some of you here in this church that the reason that you're not seeing things turning over is you're not desperate about it. You don't grieve and pour out your heart to God about it. You pray more like, well, God, I hope it goes all right. God, I hope it's all right. God, I hope it's okay. Sometimes we don't pray desperate because it ain't us. Just got to live with outcome. If I'm going in for open heart surgery, it's me that's going to be cut on. I'm praying different than the guy that I barely know and went to school with 20 years ago who's eating his Big Mac going, oh, by the way, touch old Pastor Myers and he takes another chomp and another bite of french fries. Hey, I'm praying different because I'm the one going to be cut on because it's me, it's my house, it's my family, it's my marriage, my ministry, my children in trouble, my wife in pain. You pray different when it hits home, same out. But when you don't pray with desperation, you can't expect anything to change. Change. Wow, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, Heron's, Hannah's barrenness motivated her to a sincere prayer. But I preached all of this because I want to show you what I feel is the beauty of the entire story that I never really picked up on before. But as I was reading through this story, we kind of cherry picked some of the more valuable verses in the story. I want you to see that what Tell me this, what was it that Hannah prayed for? She prayed for what? A child. Good answer, son. You know what she didn't pray for? She never prayed for a prophet. I'm preaching to you this morning when a prayer becomes a prophet. Whenever I... Whenever I was lost, y'all heard me joke around about it. It is comical on the surface, but I mean to tell you, my wife prayed, oh, God, save my husband. I mean, I was ratchet and wretched. <laughs> save my lost husband. And whenever I told the night I told her I, I felt called to preach, she said, Lord, I didn't pray for that. Huh? And that's the serious truth. She wasn't even laughing about it. 
She was dead serious. When I talked, she said, I can't be no preacher's wife. Ain't no way. That's what she said. But you know what her story makes me think of? It makes me think about the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 3 and 20. Listen to this. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Do you know that the word exceeding in the original Greek language is the word hooper, which means above and beyond. Somebody say that, above and and beyond. God, give me a child. God said, I heard you, and I'm about to move above and beyond. The word abundant speaks of measure. So in other words, God goes above and beyond by great measure. You thought all I was going to do is just put a dent, patch a dent in your fender. God said, I'm going to give you a complete overhaul. I'm going to change. But the reason that some folks don't get it is because the measure of their faith, uh, they barely can believe God for a little bondo in the dead when you ought to be believing God to give you a brand new ride say man my God help us I'm not seeing us being patched back together I'm seeing us better than we ever was say man Woo! someone say man she prays for a child, but she's not praying for a prophet. She's not praying, God, turn this little boy into the prophet of God of the hour. That's not what she's praying for. But God says, I heard your prayer. I just came to tell somebody, God can take your little prayer that you may think is not a just, oh, it's just a little old thing. God's going to turn that thing around, and he's going to make it even greater than what you thought it could be. That's right. Give the Lord a hand. I want to tell somebody this morning, I want you to listen to me. You will never have Hannah's prophet until you learn how to have Hannah's prayer. You've heard this saying before, people want what you got, but they're not willing to do what you did to get what you got. They want your anointing. They want your victory. And by the way, I heard someone say this years ago, a man forevermore the truth. You ever listen to a, a really anointed singer, anointed preacher? Do you realize the anointing makes what we do look easy? Because it ain't easy. But the anointing makes it look easy. It'll make it look so easy that everybody thinks, well, I could preach. I could sing. I could do that. You can't do nothing without the help of God. You wouldn't even have breath in your lungs right now, honey, if it wasn't for God. But the anointing makes what we do look easy. And whenever people say, oh, what a phenomenal message. You know what I try always to do? To give God the glory because I realize that I cannot afford to be a glory grabber. That's what I call it. I can't afford to do that because I know who receives the credit. I know who deserves the credit. They could have come along, Brother Jesse, and patted Hannah on the shoulder. Good way to go, baby girl. You gave us a child. You brought a child into the world. Whoa, look for a little. We need to give you a batch of chocolate chip cookies. Said, you made it possible. You made it happen. You brought a child into the world. And that is an accomplishment. Don't get me wrong. But she could have easily said, no, if you only knew the moment of affliction, the day that I wept sore, the day that I was afflicted, the day that I poured out my heart before God and the God of all of glory thundered from heaven with an answer. And he said, I'm not just going to give you a child. I'm giving you a prophet. I'm going to step it up a notch and the world will hear your story for generations. They'll know about what I did. They'll hear about how I touched you. They'll hear about how I healed your womb. That other woman who's laughing at you because you ain't got a child, guess what? She might have a child, but she ain't got a prophet. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, your next door neighbor might got a child, but does she got a prophet? If you'll just be faithful, and you'll trust God. God said, I'm going to take care of you. Whew. Anybody else feel that in this house? I just feel like that that prayer answering God is in the house right now. I feel like that prayer answering God's in the house right now. Sister Myers, you do me a favor. I want to, Devin, go get Sister Miranda. I want somebody this morning that's in a place of their life that said, I've been needing answers. 
I, I need answers. I need God to show me, reveal, give me a revelation. I need God to move in a situation. I've got a lost family member. I've been putting before God. I haven't seen them uh, saved as of yet. I want somebody who means serious business with God, who is willing to take the time, whether it's to whisper a prayer in the altar, to beat on the altar, scream out loud, but somebody this morning willing to say, I need you. Will you stand to your feet across this house? God, I cannot do this thing by myself. I might can fix a carburetor on the mower, God, but I sure ain't been able to fix this. <laughs> I might can put a brand new alternator on that old rusty thing, but I can't fix this one. I done tried, and I keep messing it up. I want to tell you all a little something. My kids, if you ask them, they think I can fix anything. And I got to working on something the other day, and I found something that I'm not very good at. I got a lot of work ahead of me. And some of you that got the magic and the finesse of being able to buff and polish stuff, man, it was looking worse than before, like somebody smeared milk on it or something. But it's good to realize you can't fix everything. It's good to understand no matter how much catfishing you've done in your whole life and how you provided for the family and made a way, it's good every once in a while for God to say, sit back and relax for a little while while I show you I'm still God. Because God knows, God knows that in your inability to fix it, he will shine brighter and greater. What if God allowed you to go through the stuff you've been going through or the mess you've been in so that he could prove to you that he's able to make a way? You didn't see any way whatsoever. You thought there was no way it's not possible. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed across the church this morning in reverence to the Spirit of the Lord, I wonder, is there anyone today that you've been praying, God, I need an answer. God, give me a child, so to speak. And all the while, you didn't realize that God's not just going to do what you ask. He's going to take it a step further. What if, what if this one altar service was the very time and the place that God was going to begin to unfold your miracle in the making? If it was, how would you pray? How would you pray? God, save my husband. Save my child. God, fix this marriage. God, work in this ministry. God, heal my body. If that's you, I would encourage you to come to this altar this morning. Follow the, follow the pattern set forth by Hannah. Someone who was willing to pray. Someone who was willing to pour out her heart before God. In spite, in spite of everything wrong, in spite of the fact that her mind was being afflicted by the adversary, how that, how that hell was fighting your mind so bad, how that hell was convincing you there's no reason to pray. Why even bother? Your mind has been so afflicted by the enemy that you've given up hope to see an answer. If that's you right now, are you willing to lay at the feet of Jesus? Are you willing to shed tears regardless of what anybody thinks about the tears you shed? Are you willing to say, God, you know how painful it is. To live with someone who don't love God like I do. Are you willing to put that need before God? Say, God, I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of living by myself. If you have somebody that you're going to put in my life, God, who will it be? When will it be? Send the right person at the right time. Maybe you're going through a time of depression. And you say, oh, God, I'm tired of being depressed. If that's you. Give it to God. Saints of God, I want you to pray with your heart.